Hey there, and welcome to the second video in the HTML series on Curious Byte. Now in this video, we'll be looking at more advanced HTML topics. So we'll start off by looking at meta tags. Now meta tags go within the head element and they provide metadata about the HTML document itself. They're typically used to specify things like a character set, a page description, keywords, author of the document, or just viewport settings for different devices. So let's add a meta tag and we'll start off by adding a character set and we'll do that by creating a meta element like this, adding a character set and setting it to UTF-8. Now UTF-8 stands for Unicode Transformation Format and one of the best things about this and it was something that was created by the Unicode Consortium a while back. In the grim old days of the internet there was only a very limited character set called ASCII and ASCII only worked with basically English or Latin character sets. Nowadays you'll have Chinese character sets, you'll have Arabic character sets and all kinds of character sets around the world. You essentially use all of them now within UTF-8. So that's the benefit of it. It gives that power to your website and you want it on every single web page you make, trust me. Now speaking of characters, one thing that you do need to be aware of is that there is a reserved character list in HTML. So if we have a look here, the ampersand, the less than sign and the greater than sign in the quote is actually a reserved character. And the reason being is if we go here, for example, and if we are to type in a less than sign, you'll see that it has an immediate effect. The code editor itself thinks it's now a HTML element. And if we go here, the HTML text has disappeared. And if we have a look into it, we can see it now considers the H1 to be a HTML element. And all we've done is we've just added this less than sign. So we have to be very careful how we go about this. Now, the way to counter this and to be able to use reserved characters like this is using what we call HTML entities. And all you do is you add an ampersand. And if we get rid of that, and then we type in less than or LT, we should now be able to add the less than sign. So a HTML entity comprises of three things the ampersand, the HTML entity within the middle, and the semicolons. And if we go here, we can have a full list of all the HTML entities. So if you want a left arrow, you can have that. If you want an up arrow, that's the uh, HTML entity for that, and so on and so forth. There's a whole bunch out there, and there's all kinds of symbols and uh, characters that you can add to your website through HTML entities. But it's a great way of getting past the reserved character list. So we'll get rid of this for now. But let's have a look at making a form. We'll start a form here. We'll create a form element and by itself it won't do anything. What we'll need to do is we'll need to put some other form elements within it to actually do something. There are many different elements and very different variations of those elements that you can use. So what we'll do is we'll pop in an input element And we'll add a type of text. And what this does is it adds a HTML element on the right here into the web page. And you can simply just type any text into here. And it works just great. You can even type numbers as well. It doesn't matter what you do, it'll turn it all into a string, which is just text basically. So that's all well and good. But what if we want to add a input where you can only put numbers in them? Now this is useful when you're creating a form that needs to have a telephone or mobile phone capture. So if we go in here and we simply do the same that we did last time, but instead of text, we will put number. And then what we get, an input where you can only put numbers in. So if I try to type characters, which I'm trying now, I, I can't put any in. But if we put numbers in, it works great. And this is great for mobile phone capture. Now the problem with that is we've got two inputs right next to each other that look very similar, but it's hard to differentiate which is which. Now there's a few ways to tackle this. We can add some labels, which would look like this. So we add a label element like that. And then if we add, let's say for example, name, and then we'll add number here. 
Let's add telephone actually. Let's put that. And what this has done is this has created a name label and a telephone label. Now by itself, that won't really work when the form goes more to completion. What we need to do is we need to connect these labels and these inputs together. And the way you do that is you add a name to your input. So for this, we'll add name. And for this input here, we'll add a name of telephone. And then if we go to label here, we'll type in for telephone. And that essentially has connected these two together. So when the form is ready and has logic in it, that this will actually work now. So if we go for, and we will go, oh, not telephone again, we'll go name. Brilliant, so those are both connected up and they're working great. So those are both connected up and they're working great. So let's add another input. Now, just to note, there are many different types of inputs. If we go down here, we can see that there's buttons, there's checkboxes, there's dates, there's emails, there's files. You can do file picker, do date pickers, color pickers. The list is endless. In fact, let's show you a color picker. So if you see there, very simple input type color. And we've added a name, which is what we've already added before, and an ID. Now we don't need that for now, just for demoing purposes. We'll have a look over here, and if we click this, we now get a color wheel. And we can set any color we want. We get this out of here. Brilliant. So another good input to add is a checkbox. And this is something you'll probably use quite a lot. So another thing we can add is a checkbox. And this is quite handy if you know you might have some terms and services you want them to agree to. So we'll add another label here and we'll say terms and services. And we'll add a name here for that. We'll put, do you agree to our terms and services? And that's come up there. Now, what we want to do is we need to add a few more elements to make this a proper form. So we'll add an email address. And we can do that by simply changing the type here to email. And we'll give it a name of email. And we will also add a label for it. So now we have a very basic form, but inputs aren't the only thing you can add in a form element. There are some other cool features that you want to create in a form. So if, for example, we want to create a drop down menu, there are a couple options. You can either use a select drop down, in which it's a bit like an unordered list. So you have your select drop down, and you can already see that that's popped up here. And then we can add some options. So we'll add an option of choice one, let's say, for example. And we'll add a couple, so we'll add, well, a few. So we'll add three choices. So then if we go here, it will say choice one, choice two, choice three. And that's a very, very quick and simple drop down menu. So now that we've finished this form off, one thing that will come apparent if you're building along is that it's just a load of inputs and drop down menus and checkboxes. There's not much to do with it. Well, if we want to submit this information, we'll need a button. One thing about a button element is it doesn't necessarily have to be kept within a form. You can actually use a button element outside of a form. So if we go into this section here and we type in button, and we type in submit, for example, we can see that there's a submit button here now and it's outside of a form and it works just great. But what we want to do is we actually want to place that within the form. So we'll bring that all the way down into the form below the terms and services checkbox. 
So now we have that like this, which is brilliant. You may have noticed that there's no real functionality to this form for now. All it does is it just refreshes the page and doesn't do much more than that. And that's because we need JavaScript to add functionality to this form or some other kind of logic to essentially add some something for this form to do. Right now, it's just a very skeletal form. Other than layout, there's nothing to it. So that's our form for now. It isn't functional, but that's not a problem. We'll go back and we'll add some logic and we'll add some styling and we'll tidy that up just fine. So one great thing we can do in HTML is add links in between the page. So we can actually have links that jump us around the page to specific sections. If we were to go to the footer, for example, we can have a link that sends us to the top of the page. So if I was to add an anchor tag here, which is the A element or the A tag. And then we'll say, let's go to the top. Now here you can see that we've added a hashtag, which denotes that we are targeting an ID. So in the first video, we looked over classes. So if you can see here that we have a class of underline, which is a selector for an element, there is another form of selector for an element that we can use called an ID. So yeah, as you can see, we've targeted that. We'll put in top here. And then if we go up, we'll add that ID here to the header. So simply to add an ID to a HTML element, all you do is type ID. And it's just the same as class, except that you will type in top. And this is selectable in CSS and in JavaScript. So this can be targeted by multiple different coding languages. So let's give this a try. Now the one problem is the page itself isn't very long. So we'll pad it out a bit and uh, we will add some elements just to add some padding. So we'll add some uh, break elements just to give it some space. So now you can see that this is down here. We'll add a few more. So now you can see the top is here. And if we left click this, it'll take us all the way to the very top. But let's say, for example, we don't want to go all the way to the very top. We want to go to a different section. So let's go here and we will create a H2 called middle of the page. And then we will add an ID of middle. And let's change that to middle. And let's add some more spacing. So now we have the middle of the page here and we have the top. Let's change this to middle as well. Why not? So if we click middle, then it takes us to the middle of the page. Let's have one for top as well. And let's say, let's go to the top now. And that takes us to the top. And it's a great little tool to help navigate within the website. Now you wouldn't just simply do a straight jump to the top because it's very jerky. You would add some kind of animation and you would slow it down and maybe add some bounce, but that's an entirely separate video and that's an entirely separate skill set in itself to add animation to a website. So we will get rid of this one for now and we will get rid of all this. And we will keep that. So what we're going to do, just want to tidy this up. I'm going to add word wrap to this. A lot of people don't like to have word wrap because they like to have everything on the same line. And that's how I prefer to work as well. Because I like to know that if I'm looking at a line, it is that line. But just for demoing purposes, I just want to show you all the code. So we're just going to show you, try and show you as much code as possible for this next bit. Now, when creating a website, the need may arise to add a video. And the simplest way to do that is to add a video element. And what we want to do is if we look here, it's immediately taking the space. We want to actually increase the size of it and we want it to be 100% width. And you can do that with the width attribute and a height attribute. So it's very similar to image in that sense. And we want to add a placeholder image. Now on a video, it's called something slightly different. It's called a poster. So if we add a poster, we'll add a poster from placeholder. 
So we'll go to place hold and we will say, let's say 1,200 by 500. Yep, that fits the space. Now we also want to add the source to this uh, video. So we'll go down here, put this on another line and we'll go here and we'll add the source just so it wraps in nicely. We'll go and grab the movie source and we'll pop that in there. Now we also want to set the type of video. Now this particular type of video will be an MP4. Now one thing you might realize is that it's just the poster for now. But what we need to do is we need to add controls. So once we've added controls, you can see immediately it now becomes a video. It even has the video time length here, the start time, the volume, the full screen, all kinds of options. And it comes with its own sets of default animations. We've not added any CSS, JavaScript or styling but you've got video functionality built into HTML. So let's give this a test. So let's press play. Oop. And there you can see it's working just fine. Brilliant. Now we might not want to have the video uh, in line like this. We might want to have multiple video sources. And the way we handle that is if we open this up like this and we take the source from here and we say we are going to add a source element within here. Now a source element is similar to uh, an option element within a select in that it is an option to this video to choose this source. And you can have different reasons for choosing the source, but in this case, we will just say that the source will be, oh, we've already added that. We'll add it like this. So that's out of the type and the source. And that's brilliant. Let's tidy this up a little bit. Now a great use for source is for example, if you want multiple sources, if one source goes down. So if one source goes down, you have another video in its place. And if that goes down, you have a third one, etc., etc. So you never really miss out if something happens. It's great for just making sure that, that there is a video of some kind, even if it's just like an error video or something. You'd have a placeholder video. That's the, the benefits of using source. And that's how you add videos to a website. We'll just indent this a little bit okay and let's give this a whirl okay well that seems to have an issue okay so this i think has been tabbed so let's go back yep it's been tabbed just sort that formatting out brilliant and then we're back and let's give this a whirl as well yep and that's working too brilliant So that is videos. So what we'll do now is we will add an image to the website, but we've already added an image in the first video, but we'll do it slightly differently. We're going to use a similar method that we used for the video here to have multiple sources for the picture. So we'll start by adding an image, uh, a default image using the image tag, and we will use a slightly different website than we normally use. We've normally used uh, placehold. Let's use place kitten. So let's have a 200 by 300 kitten. Oh, actually the 200 one was quite cute. Let's just stick with that one. And we'll put a confused cat as the alt tag. So the alt tag is simply just a description of what the image is. We can actually add a title for this picture so when you hover over it, it should actually say something. So if we put a confused kitten, it should say a confused kitten. Now we've got our image source. What we want to do is add a picture element. So similar to video, we'll add that, open that up and pop this inside. And that works just the same. And what we'll do now is we will add 
another source for this video and we'll do it using a source attribute. So let's give it an image source and we will use place kitten again. And let's go up in size, let's use 400. And we have another QCAT. Let's say that after mobile, this is what gets shown. And we can do that by saying that after this media width, we want to show this image. So you can be very clever how you show these images. So you can say after 420 pixels, I want to show this image. Probably don't need that. There we go. And then we get that image showing instead of that, even though that is the default image. Now let's add another source and let's say the minimum width will be 720 pixels and we will use a 700 cat. Now this is a mega cat. Oh, multiple cats. And we can actually show that in work. So if we go here and we just switch to a side dock, we can actually watch this in action. Boom. And there you go. That is picture elements. So another great thing HTML can do for you, it automatically fits the space as, as best as it can. However, if you don't want to do that, there is an element for pre-formatted text. So you don't have any pre-formatting and it's great for showing code or somewhere where you can have text that you've got line spacing, lines in odd places and tabs and things. So I'll show you an example. We should put some code in here. It'll show without any of the normal HTML. So for example, if I was to take this and put it in a P tag, it would show like this. But in a pre-formatted element, it allows you to retain all the lines, all the tabs, all the indentations and everything. It's a cool little uh, element that HTML comes packing with. So before we finish up, I just wanted to go over a couple cool features that we've missed out on that HTML5 has added. One of those is required, which is an input attribute to make sure that that input is required by the form. So when we click submit, it should tell us that this is required. And it simply types in like this, and then we put in required again, and that'll be the name attribute here. That'll be the name input here. And then we click submit, boom. As we haven't filled it out, it's not happy and it's given us an error. So if we type in a name, then we click it and it's happy and it's fine. But we also want the email to be required as well. So we'll add that here. But we don't really want the telephone. We're not too bothered about that. So we could just em enter it as an empty one, which basically means it's not required or we can just leave it all together. Now, the other great thing that was added was placeholder attributes. With inputs, you can actually set a default value and a default placeholder. For example, with an input, we could say the default value is first name. So by default, you can see that the first name is set to first name, but it's something that you can delete and you can edit and it still actually stays there. So for example, if you don't delete it all, part of whatever the value was gets submitted as well, which isn't what you want. A better alternative is using the new HTML5 input attribute of placeholder. And you can see immediately that the styling has changed and it isn't a value in itself. If I was to type in a name, we can then see that come up there. And that's essentially how placeholder attributes work. So two very cool features of HTML5, which I recommend you playing around with. Having a look at just, in general, some of the amazing attributes that input has. So another cool feature before we go is the progress bar. So we can simply add a progress bar with HTML very simply by adding a value. Now, by itself, it doesn't mean much. It's very static. Static meaning it's not moving, it's not doing anything. Without JavaScript, without logic being uh, used on this, it's pretty dead. Um, and what we can do is we'll add a label for this. We'll add an ID of 
file and we'll say form progress. We'll say 25%. In a later video, we'll come back and we will sort this out and we will add some logic to it and make it actually work. So as you fill out the form, this should fill up as well. So I hope that was useful. That wasn't quite everything. There are nuances to every different element and different versions and different things you can do, but this should give you a very strong understanding of some of the more advanced HTML features out there. So with that knowledge now, build, create, have fun. I've been Harry and you've been watching Curious Byte.